Hi, welcome back to my shed. In this short video I'm going to show you how I made a flexible drive coupling for my add-on four-jaw chuck. Although I spent a lot of time trying to ensure the utmost precision during the construction of the two-chuck system, there are many times when things may not quite go according to plan, causing the four-jaw chuck's spindle to become misaligned. Any misalignment between the three jaw chuck and a restrained spindle directly attached to it will inevitably damage something, so I need what I'm calling a flexible kinetic parallel coupling. Flexible so that it allows connection between the two misaligned spindles. Kinetic to remain connected but rotationally inflexible, so they're not using rubber between the two components. Parallel so that the axial offsets remain parallel to each other. There are many ways to do this, but here are three ways. One, to use a couple of inline hardy spicer type couplings and a short shaft. But this is going to reduce what available workspace I've got. Two would be to use a Schmidt type coupling but this system needs a minimum of at least nine components. Three, use an Oldham type coupling. Now this is a more promising solution because I'm guessing that any misalignment of my components will be small. As you can see here, the Oldham type coupling relies upon two slots or keys at right angles to each other on the central free floating disc. Each spindle end requires one receiving key or slot. When assembled, the two spindles will rotate as one, even if they're not aligned. My next problem is that I've invested a lot of time on this double chuck system and I don't want to ruin it now. I also don't want to mill a slot or key across the end of the secondary spindle only to find it doesn't work as I expect. So whatever I do it must be reversible. At first I did think about using the Hardy Spicer system mounted on the end of a Morse 4 taper so that the flexible section remained inside the jaws. But if the Morse taper ever gave way under load, it, I would lose the precision of my dead centre inside the main spindle tube, and I don't want that to happen. Then I hit on the idea of replacing the two keys for ground rollers. After all, it could make them replaceable. And the free floating disc to have four short captive slots in it, after all, it too would be replaceable. The only way to find out if it will work, as my dad used to say, was Son, sometimes you just got to suck it and see. So to convince myself that the system is a good idea, I made a mock-up using wood and four nails. I know it's a very poor example, but I just wanted to see for myself. And here it is. This is the very trial I did. Despite its roughness, it worked very well. For this very quick project, I use very few materials. Some you see here but I later changed some as well. After machining a bit of stock down to about 45mm diameter, I use my bandsaw to lop off a 50mm long piece of quite hard material to act as a surrogate stub shaft. It was then end faced and chamfered at both ends.
This next bit of material was even harder and after losing the battle with the bandsaw it too was faced on both sides. I hadn't got any rollers about 10mm diameter so I decided instead to use high tent style cap head bolts and by grinding all the heads to 12mm diameter I should be able to tap uh, the end of the shafts and use these as surrogate rollers. After all they don't spin. After satisfying myself with the dowel pin situation it was time to get on with the free floating disc. Four equally spaced holes were drilled on a 30mm PCD. Each of these holes was radially elongated to clean up to achieve four 12mm wide slots. With the material being a bit hard combined with the height of the holding device and that of the milling head was almost at full height it caused quite a lot of vibration. It wasn't until the last slot that I'd actually found the easiest technique to cut the slots and reduce the vibration. This centre finder is rubbish. The reason I'm using cap head bolts is that there's a good chance that if something did go wrong the heads hopefully would shear off. Then it's back to the drawing board or in my case having a go at sucking something else. The good thing about this material is the threads should hold up better against any wear and tear. I use lead as soft jaws to hold this stub shaft. Both mating faces were hand buffed with a flatting stone to reduce what friction there might be, but also to remove the edges that might snag. I used soft hands to hold the chuck while I tapped this end of the spindle and it wasn't easy I tell you. With a drizzle of grease between all of the components I hope that this finished component functions as I hope it should. What you don't see in the previous video is that one of my jaws in the three jaw chalk has a slight error when it's open to around about 45mm. So I shimmed that with a little bit of cigarette paper to remove the error. This stub shaft was not clocked up or shimmed. It isn't even going to be marked to line up with the same jaw. It's just going to be shoved in and clamped up. So there will be an error right away, however small. Now for the scary bit. I'm going to simulate a bit of swarf under the pedestal. Yeah okay it's a two millimeter chunk of steel but for the time being we'll call it a tiny bit of swarf.
The pedestal spindle does move a tiny bit because I've only nipped the securing bolts up and the whole thing is lopsided and rocking on top of a dirty big chunk of steel. Sorry, I meant a little bit of swarf. It's a simple solution that works well. When I find a little time, I'll be incorporating it into a much larger and fully enclosed coupling that will sit between the jaws and over the spindle using a single keyway. That's all for now. Once again, thanks for watching. Bye.